So on Monday, I assume that you heard about uh, cardiac modeling already, uh, indeed. But essentially, regarding the, the electrophysiology of the heart, that is the electrochemical phenomena, uh, today I will talk about biomechanical modeling, both uh, direct and inverse. And you will see the, this will cover uh, quite a, a wide area of, uh, of subjects, that is going from multi-scale uh, modeling to uh, experimental validation and, and uh, clinical applications with a specific subject that will be a patient-specific modeling that I will uh, tell you about soon. So this is really uh, teamwork that I'm going to present, Medicine, that is an INRIA team now joined with LMS, Laboratoire de Mécanique des Solides, Ecole Polytechnique and CNRS. The outline of my talk. So uh, again, this will be uh, biomechanical modeling and, 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 and vastly multi-scale, multi as, as you will see in a minute. Uh, so focus on mechanical modeling and the uh, electrical chemical input uh, phenomena will be seen as an input to the mechanics. Uh, we'll we'll cover some uh, validation using experimental data, you will see. Uh, and now, of course, we need to not only talk about uh, material modeling, but also organ and system modeling. And this will be illustrated with uh, uh, a clinical application that's called uh, cardiac resynchronization therapy, CRT. And the last part of my talk would be dedicated to specific considerations regarding inverse problems uh, aimed at estimating uh, the, the, the model for, for the purpose of patient-specific modeling, so adapting the model to a given situation, and again with a, a detailed uh, validation. Modeling of the heart starts, uh, of course, uh, from the myocardium, that is the, the, the material itself, the muscle, that we need to, uh, to model. And as I mentioned, this is, this is uh, hugely multi-scale because it starts uh, actually at, at this scale and below. This is a, a single myocyte, uh, a cardiac cell, that is beating live, so to speak, in a microscope. Uh, this is typically 100 microns long here. And below this scale, what the, the, the bending structure that you see here translates uh, reflects the, the, the basic entity of, of uh, muscle contraction that lies within the cells, and that's called the sarcomere that you see here. So uh, two bands uh, uh, denote the ending of the, of, the, of the sarcomere, and the sarcomere is uh, made of a specific arrangement of two types of filaments, so-called actin and myosin filaments, that are able to create bonds with each other. So there are uh, head-like structures on the myosin filaments that can attach on the other uh, actin uh, filaments, and that creates forces that tend to shorten the, the whole structure. The, 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 the basic uh, type of, of description that we use is actually inspired from uh, Huxley, that, that who was a, a great man in cardiac modeling. Uh, so we revisited uh, a, a model that he proposed in uh, 1957 to describe, statistically speaking, the attachment of such, uh, of such heads, so so-called cross bridges between the two uh, types of filaments, via the, 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 very, the, the, the n quantity that's here, and n denotes for the population of heads that are located at the distance s from the nearest actin site at a given time t. So for this population, the ratio of actually created bridges. So this is really uh, accounting for these, these, uh, these uh, myosin heads that is described by this equation. So what we have here, EC dot, is the strain rate, extension rate of the whole sarcomere. So the, the, the filaments slide 
along each other. This is the so-called sliding filament theory. And uh, in the right-hand side, what you have is creation and destruction rates, F and G. And N0 would be uh, another, uh, quanti another function to, to model. So essentially here, to obtain, so S, again, denotes the, it's, it's important as, as a variable in this equation, other than the time. S is the, the, the location, the, the distance to the nearest actin site. So that would be the extension of the uh, myosin head, if you represent it like this, like a, a spring-like structure, when the head is actually attached. So here, what you need to model, to in a way close the, the whole problem, are the creation and destruction rates in the right-hand side, and the energy that would be created in uh, a cross bridge once the, the, the bond is actually created. And once you have modeled the energy in particular, with the end variable, you can average over the whole population to obtain, so the, this would be the, uh, the, the derivative of the energy with respect to extension would be, of course, the force created in a single bridge. So if you uh, average over the whole population using n, you obtain the total force, the average force created in a, in a sarcomere. So this is how we will travel uh, over the scales using the, the n variable. More generally speaking, a type of equ equation that we can look at is, pertains to what uh, is called the moments of n. So moments are obtained by weighing uh, powers of s with n over all possible values of s. And if you multiply the Huxley equation by s to the p and, and integrate, you obtain uh, a dynamical equation like this on, on the moment of order p that relates the, the variation rate of, of uh, mu p to the previous uh, moment and, of course, quantities that are inherited from the, from the rates. Now, what we frequently consider in our models are the simplest uh, modeling choices for the three quantities that uh, I pointed out on the previous slides. So creation, destruction rates, essentially two different chemical reaction rates depending on a switch that represents the, the calcium concentration above or below a certain uh, level. So if it's above, you create. If it's below, you destroy the, the, uh, the, the bonds. And for the energy of bridges, the simplest you can think of is, of course, uh, quadratic energy with a little shift. That means that when you attach, you're already under tension. So this is uh, so-called symmetry breaking uh, in, uh, in physics. This is described in more details in, uh, in various papers, but again, it's, it, this, these are the simplest choices that you can think of. And now, at the macroscopic level, uh, so if you consider the average, the, the integral of n, you will obtain something that's proportional to the total number of actually created bridges at a given time t. So the KC here only depends on t, of course. It's average over s. And if you multiply by the uh, individual stiffness of one single bridge, you obtain something that uh, denotes, that represents the stiffness of the, of the whole sarcomere. So this is the moment of order 0 uh, on the previous slide. It's the integral of n multiplied by s to the 0. Now, the, the stress created in sarcomeres, again, I showed this on, on uh, the, the, the first slide, would be obtained by uh, differentiating the energy of a bridge. So this is this uh, quantity here. And you can see that it's a combination of two moments, zero order and first order moments. Now, if you write the equation uh, uh, obtained from the moment equation on the previous slide, you obtain these differential equations here, this uh, ODE system here, that uh, describe tau C, the stress in the sarcomere, and, and KC, the equivalent stiffness of the sarcomeres. And this you can think of as some kind of uh, complex constitutive equation that relates the, the extension, 
strain to the stress via, of course, some uh, uh, time-dependent equations. So the rates are appearing here. And, and the, the system also needs this equivalent uh, stiffness as an intermediate variable. And u here is directly something that, uh, that is inherited from the, the rates, the chemical rates that uh, appeared on the previous slide. So it's a summary of f and g, if you like. So u is one constant if the concentration is above the threshold, and minus the other one if it's below. And likewise, you can also monitor the microscopic energy, that is the energy that is stored within uh, the chemical bonds. And this would uh, use the second order moment in addition to the, the, to the first two. So you can obtain an, an equation that describes the energy as well. Now, this was for the active behavior, so the active forces that are created uh, within the sarcomeres. Of course, it's not the whole story because there's a lot of passive behavior also in uh, such a system, in particular for the endings of the sarcomeres and then for the whole cellular envelope and beyond for the extracellular uh, matrix. So all this need, uh, needs to, take, uh, to be taken into account. And this we do by uh, rheological modeling in which various types of behaviors are aggregate, aggregated, aggregated within uh, this type of uh, uh, spring combination and, and uh, dampers combination uh, analogy. So here the sarcomeres would be at this location over here, and it's in series with some elastic components uh, in parallel with, with viscosity. This is quite uh, typical. And then, so this would be the endings of the sarcomeres, typically. And then in parallel with, uh, again, viscoelastic uh, behavior for the cell envelope and the extracellular matrix. What's important is that the sarcomeres uh, essentially create forces and stresses in uh, the, the direction of the muscle fiber. So this is essentially 1D, what you have uh, in the, the top branch. And, and the rest is, of course, 3D. And this is one way of modeling, but of course you can sophisticate as much as you like, uh, starting actually with the description of the sarcomeres themselves. So we could take additional chemical states. Here we, you had only two uh, uh, for the myosin heads, and additional internal variables. And now, if you... Th this schematic here, I, I mentioned it was... a an analogy with springs and dampers, it needs to be interpreted in a consistently nonlinear manner because the, the strains that we're going to look at are large. So not only displacements, but also strains are large. So this needs to be uh, revisited in this framework if you want to be energy consistent, which is essential here, like uh, we heard uh, yesterday uh, in climate uh, uh, modeling. And once you do this, you can obtain the complete energy balance that describes the variation of the, ener the total energy, so kinetic, uh, elastic stored here and there, and then the elastic energy stored in the sarcomeres with uh, external power of forces. This, this would be the engine uh, input due to, uh, so the positive input due to chemistry, and these are dissipations. Some more details quickly uh, regarding the whole behavior. So the, 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 the fundamental equation would be the principle of dynamics, the so-called principle of virtual work that's written here in, in total Lagrangian. That is, you use a reference configuration to describe the displacements, y. So y double dot would be the acceleration. Here you have the inertia effects. Here you have the external forces. Uh, represented here by essentially pressure against which uh, the, the heart walls would uh, actually work. So external loading. And here this is the internal work. So here this is the in internal stress tensor that you have in, uh, in uh, capital sigma. And capital sigma aggregates 
the, the various uh, components that I described on the previous slide. So that is, uh, we'll take hyperelastic uh, parts, viscous parts, and the part that was in the 1D sarcomere branch. For the hyperelastic term, we use something that's very standard in biomechanical uh, modeling, that is exponential laws, plus something that allows to model uh, incompressibility, because uh, biological tissues are frequently very incompressible, say. Another viscous term that's here, we take the simplest that we can think of, so the, something that's the, essentially the square of the, of the strain rate. And again, the active part that will govern this 1D uh, tensor, stress tensor along, the, this, this is the, the fiber direction, N, so this gives you a, a second order tensor. And uh, this stress tensor directed along uh, the fiber direction uh, is, is the result of the sarcomere uh, modeling. So this is a very fast overview of the type of uh, modeling that you can perform. But now we have something that's complete, that's uh, quite general, because this is one choice, but you could use uh, other uh, constitutive choices. And that's, again, energy consistent. Now, let's look at some experimental validations that we performed for this uh, model. Uh, so this is at, at, I could say, at the local scale. You want to check that the material actually, the, the active material behaves as uh, modeled uh, in the equations. And then we talk about uh, the, the heart scale, that is the, the, the global uh, stage. But here for the experimental validation at the local scale, we used some data uh, in collaboration with a physiologist data obtained on th this uh, type of uh, little samples taken from, uh, from lab, lab rats. So these are called papyri muscles. They are made of the same myocardium material as the walls of the heart, but they are much easier to deal with when uh, isolated uh, from, from the heart. They're still active when you, when you, when you sever them. And then you submit these uh, samples to a, a cycle of, uh, of loading that's designed to mimic the cardiac cycle. So first, you extend them passively, so you exert a load on them, and then you will make them contract by electrical activation, and you prevent the fiber from shortening until they're able to reach uh, a higher uh, force, and then they shorten and they come back. So here, this would represent the, the passive feeling of the heart, the first stage of the, of the cardiac cycle. And then this would represent here the, uh, well, actually this one would represent the eject ejection phase of the heart against a higher pressure, that is the pressure uh, prevailing in the arterial system. So this would be the pressure prevailing in the venous system and that in the arterial system. What you measure, well, forget about this uh, figure here, but what you measure in these experiments are recordings over time of the force measured at the tip of the sample. So it's, it's limited by this uh, M1 plus M2 value that you have seen. And then shortening of the sample over the, over the cycle. And this is what we uh, aim at reproducing with the model, which you see here. So this is a comparison over time of force and uh, extension, so shortening in this case, against two initial loads, two levels of uh, preload, so the M1, and then several levels of uh, M1 plus M2. And it's a comparison, again, over time of these two quantities between simulated in dashed and uh, experimental in solid lines. So as you can see, over the various types of loading, it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty uh, reasonable, reasonably accurate. Now, again, if you want to go to the organ scale, uh, it presents uh, some additional challenges. 
In particular, well, in, in the muscle sample case, the, the, the fiber direction was quite uh, straightforward. But uh, in general, for the, for the heart, the structure is complicated, and the fiber directions are not uh, something that you can measure in vivo. So in a, in a patient, it's not something that you could, you could actually measure. So what we do is, so far, because uh, well, hopefully in the future there will be some uh, imaging modalities that uh, will be able to give you fiber directions on a patient-specific basis. But so far what we do is prescribe the fiber direction based on uh, standard anatomical knowledge, so typically based uh, on the, the position across the thickness of the muscle that we compute, we have an angle of elevation of the fibers that you can see here. This, this is the, the fiber direction used in this particular uh, patient-specific model. Now, boundary conditions are also something quite uh, complex for this type of, uh, of model, because there are complex interactions with uh, the surrounding structures, for which we use a combination of uh, viscoelastic uh, support and sliding contact, so it's, it's, it's very uh, demanding in terms of uh, modeling and, and CPU time. And also we have the truncation of the, of, of the model, because you, you, you have to truncate your system somewhere, so here you need to substitute uh, the, 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 uh, some artificial boundary conditions for the actual structures that you have uh, taken out of the system. And then you also need to close the system in terms of, uh, of uh, hemodynamics, so, so blood fluid mechanics, which uh, for many uh, cases we represent in a very simplified manner in each cavity of the heart as a single pressure volume system. So this means that you can, fr from the point of view of the tissue, for, for many uh, applications, you can consider that the pressure inside the cavity is, is uh, homogeneous, and then it simplifies. You don't need to uh, actually consider the flow equations. For other types of applications, we, we actually can consider these uh, equations. But then, if you take the, the, the cavities are as, as single pressure volume systems, then you can also close the system by uh, using simplified modeling of the outlet so the arterial, arterial network, by uh, equations that are obtained as analogies to electrical circuits, so the combinations of uh, resistances and capacitances outside of the heart. So this would close the system in terms of outgoing flow and pressure sitting at the outlet of the heart. These are called Winkessel models in, in this type of uh, application. So a set of uh, zero D, that is, uh, uh, ODs. And now we also have some difficulties with the, the reference configuration, because uh, in practice you never see the reference configuration in, in an actual heart. It's, it's always moving, say. Uh, in particular, the, the, the one that's the, the, the most still at the end of filling is, of course, not uh, stress-free, because it's, it's, it's inflated due to venous pressure. So if you want to, to find the reference configuration, that is, the, again, the stress-free configuration, you need to solve the inverse problem uh, to find the configuration in which stresses vanish. And this is difficult, well, not only because it's an inverse problem, but also because it's, it's ill-posed in this case due to the, what you see here, this curve, is the, the curve that represents the, the passive behavior of the heart, so force against extension. This is zero stress, and you see that it's extremely soft near the reference configuration. So, of course, it means that it's very difficult to get here by an inverse problem. It's very ill-posed. Okay, now let me show you uh, the type of validation that we can obtain at the end of this, uh, of this path of, of modeling. And this is, these are some, some trials that uh, we made regarding what I mentioned before as cardiac resynchronization therapy in collaboration with, uh, with clinicians from King's College London. 
Okay, this, this, this is the detailed uh, protocol, but uh, let me explain it in a few words. What happens is that for certain types of patients, the activation of the contraction is quite heavily desynchronized due to some uh, pathologies. And then, of course, as you can imagine, the, the contraction is much less effective than with a healthy heart because it's, it's desynchronized in the way that active stresses are, are, are built. So these patients suffer from uh, severe uh, symptoms, uh, heart failure, typically. Um, and the way you can try and cure them is by using this type of therapy, CRT, cardiac resynchronization, to resynchronize the contraction. And the way you do, do this is use uh, a pacemaker with several electrodes to, to activate the heart, uh, the contraction is a more, in a more synchronized manner. The problem is that uh, it is estimated that at least for 50%, if, if not two-thirds of these patients, there is actually no response, no benefit from the therapy. So it's a heavy and expensive and risky therapy to, to actually go and place these electrodes uh, on the heart, or in the heart in some cases, uh, and for at least 50% of these patients, there is no response, no benefit. So here, what's at stake is the possibility, the perspective of using modeling, patient-specific modeling, so models of a given patient, to at least detect uh, people who will not respond to, ther to therapy, and of course, also, hopefully, optimize the therapy for each specific patient, so, so uh, decrease the rate of non-responders by using the model to tailor the, the therapy. At this stage, of course, this is preliminary, what we have done, so we, it, it's a validation stage. So uh, what we looked at was how the model was, it could be used to reproduce what was actually measured in the patients. So this is what we focused on. And what's the, 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 the basic indica the, the main indicator that's used to assess the success of the therapy is by looking at the pressure inside the left ventricle, so the main ventricle. The, the increase rate of this pressure, you take the maximum, so maximum uh, pressure increase rate. And of course, the, the, the more effective contraction is, the higher this uh, indicator should be. And this is what cardiologists use, and this is what we will use as an indicator. Now, for, for one patient, this is the patient-specific model that was constructed. So here you have two cross-sections of the, of the heart, so-called long axis and short axis, left ventricle, right ventricle, left, right. And what you can see, so the electrical activation is in color, and you can see that visibly, so of course it's, uh, it's in slow, slow motion, but uh, even so, it's very visible that uh, the activation starts on the, on, in the right ventricle and then propagates uh, to the left ventricle. This should be much more synchronized in order to have a healthy heart. So it's, it's, it's a typical indication of, uh, of CRT, this patient. This is the model, so complete heart cycles, all the way uh, on the modeling, uh, at the end of the modeling path that I summarized in the first part of my, of my talk. How can this, so this is the patient before uh, therapy. How can this be uh, validated? Well, we have lots of measurements. We have the pressures inside the, the, the ventricles. We also have medical imaging. So this is the first time that you will see, but you will see more. This is a, an, an MR sequence in this case, in three uh, sections and it's compared to the boundaries in, of, the, of the model in blue. So you can see that in these two cross sections, the main ones again, the, the model follows quite uh, accurately uh, what's uh, measured in the, in the imaging. Of course, uh, as you could say, this, this is the result of calibration. So we, we tweaked all the parameter models, boundary conditions, everything that I mentioned to obtain this uh, good adequation including for the pressure. So this is the pressure inside the, the left ventricle. It's not perfect, but the peak 
of DPDT that's here is close to, uh, to data. It's simulation in dash blue and data in red solid. Uh, so this is the, the part that we will look at, this uh, peak of DPDT. So again, everything was calibrated, but now what's extremely important is that we will not change the calibration before we apply the therapy in silico. So we will try and uh, prescribe the same electrical activation as corresponds to the, to the therapy in the very strategies that were actually tried on this patient. First uh, cases here are the, th the therapies that uh, proved to be ineffective for this patient. So this, this is a patient before therapy baseline. We had this level, and, and for these two therapies, uh, the DPDT max was not increased. And, and again, the model shows what well, is, 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 is accurate, is close to, the, to what was measured. This is extremely important because here it means that the model is able to detect non-responding behavior to, to the therapy. And now, these two uh, resynchronization schemes here would be uh, strategies that uh, were actually effective for these patients. So here you see the corresponding models with the activation again in colors. And here, the DPDT max that was obtained for these two uh, cases. Again, it's the same patient with several uh, strategies that were tried. And this is a summary of DPDT max measured versus simulated for the, this patient. Okay, so this is, this is very nice in this case, but it's a single patient. So of course it requires much more validation. Uh, that is actually taking place right now within uh, a European project that's called VP2HF, to which, in which we, we take part. So in, in this project, uh, approximately 100 such cases uh, were actually uh, considered with the data collected specifically for the, for the project, and the same type of, uh, of validation is actually happening right now. Okay, so this is for the direct modeling all the way to uh, clinical application. Now, as I mentioned in the, in the beginning, I want to talk about something else in the remaining uh, uh, 15 minutes or so. I want to, to, mention, I want to cover uh, inverse problems uh, per, pertaining to uh, patient-specific type of, uh, of uh, motivations. Uh, that is, the estimation problems that you need to solve in order to adapt the model to a patient. So the types of models that we have, as you have seen, are dynamical systems that we can summarize in a very compact form, like here, so a dynamical system. X would be the, the state variable, so typically the displacements at each of the points uh, in the system. Theta would be a, a set of parameters that uh, uh, are unknown or uncertain, so that you need to adjust in order to have uh, uh, a proper dynamical behavior. The equations that would be summarized here are typically of PD uh, type, so they would uh, in particular come from the variational formulation that I showed you before. Sets of ODEs, for example, for the uh, simplified uh, fluid models that I mentioned in my uh, modeling part. So it's, it's a combination of equations that you have here. But again, it's heavily PDE-based. And what you need to estimate in order to simulate a system that will be close to the actual system is the initial condition, always. In a dynamical system, natural system like this, you never know what the initial condition is. And you need to also know, uh, adjust uh, a set of parameters again, the theta uh, vector, in order to obtain the trajectory. Now, the, the assumption that we have, and it's quite, uh, uh, it's quite valid in practice, is that we have a much higher dimension in the state. So typically what you need to estimate here would be from a few thousand to a few million degrees of freedom. 
Whereas in theta, well, uh, essentially, would, it, it, it's kind of reasonable to estimate from, say, a few tens to a few hundred uh, parameters. So very different dimensions in the two, in the two uh, vectors over there. Now, to cope with this uncertainty that we mentioned, you have actual measurements on the, on the system, measurements coming from various images and signals that you can model based on the, the state variable. So z would be the observation, the measurement vector. And uh, you can formalize the measurement process by this uh, observation operator h. And of course, you have always some error in the measurement process that's uh, denoted, denoted by key. This would, operator would represent the measurements either in a raw, but most probably in some kind of processed form. And this would summarize, here you, we had a lot of equations summarized here, and here again we have a lot of measurements summarized, in particular medical imaging. That's, uh, as you can imagine, not straightforward to, to formalize like this. But I cannot uh, dwell on this in this talk. And it's important to, 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 uh, to recognize that this, again, includes some modeling. Whatever happens in the, in the processing, this is a modeling equation that models the, the, the measurements. So in a way, we have, we have models on the two sides. Now, estimation, we, uh, we look at this from a sequential data simulation point of view. This is also known as, as filtering. Uh, so data assimilation means that we're going to use some data available on the system to reduce the uncertainty and, and actually track the, the system in time. Now, sequential means that, uh, well, this is the basic principle. So you're looking at a dynamical system in which you at least don't know the initial condition. So you have an uncertainty and initial condition, but you have measurements. And now, the principle of uh, sequential data assimilation is that you are going to simulate a system that mimics the actual system that you're uh, looking at, but you correct the system equations by a term that takes into account the discrepancy between the measurements and, and uh, the, the simulated system via the, the, the observation operator. And what you want is to design this gain operator k here uh, the gain of the, of the filter, uh, in order to... So this would be the actual system, and the, the, the system that you simulate will start from the a priori initial condition, so you have a, an error here, but you hope that with this correction in the dynamics, you can converge to the actual uh, target system. So how can you uh, achieve this? Well, this was formulated by Kalman for uh, a canonical case of a linear system, and then he formulated the, the, this type of filter in an optimal uh, setup, and this, this would be the, the continuous time Kalman equations, which can be also extended uh, in, uh, in a nonlinear system by various means, but the major drawback is that the computation of this uh, filter that sits here, so k would be this here, uh, uses the so-called covariance uh, matrix P of uh, Kalman, and the covariance uh, operator or matrix has the size of the state and is full. It has no reason, no reason to be sparse like a usual uh, physical operator. So P in, in a system like I, uh, we are considering here is not something that you can compute or even store, actually given the, type, the, the sizes of the systems. Now, another type of, uh, an, an alternative to this type of optimal filtering is given by the, 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 the theory of Luenberger, Luenberger observers. So the, the idea here is to design K as something much easier to compute, but nevertheless effective. And what you want is to have convergence of the, what's called the observer, x hat, so the, the virtual uh, in silico uh, system, simulated one, to the actual system. Uh, the way you can look at it, so if you take, on the previous slide, you take the real system and the, the, the observer system with x hat, 
and you subtract them, so you obtain the, the, the system satisfied by the error, x tilde, and what you obtain is this equation. And for, for those who have a, some background in uh, automatic control, what you will recognize is the equation of a closed loop system that's built on the original one with a measurement h and a feedback k. So it means that if you have an effective feedback operator uh, for your original system, you can use this to build a filter that will stabilize the error x tilde to zero, which is what you're trying to achieve. Uh, bringing x hat to x means bringing the error to zero. Well, this, it's a typical problem in, uh, in automatic control, so what you want is bring the poles of the system uh, as much as you can to the left-hand side of the, of the plane, and so on. And then the advantage of this strategy compared to Kalman is that for a, a wide range of systems, you have many uh, feedbacks that work, actually. Most of them are physics-based, so they're easy to implement, including in a... In the, in the simulation software. Uh, frequently, actually, the operators are already available in the, in the software at a reasonable cost and in a rather robust manner. Robustness, in this case, for a real system, is much preferable to optimality uh, that would be uh, theoretically provided by a Kalman filtering. Last but not least, the control, the feedback, is applied on not a real system, but a virtual one. So it means that you can think of a, a much wider uh, variety of uh, feedbacks. You can extend the, the, physic the, the, the dissipative feedbacks that are known for the actual systems. Now, what do you do? To, this was for state estimation. So this typically is to, to, to cope for the initial uncertainty in initial condition. Now, in, in general, you want to also estimate parameters. Well, this is the basic principle. What you do is, in the same type of setup, you consider the, uh, what's called the augmented dynamical system. So you have the first equation. We suppose that parameters here enter in a linear manner in the dynamical system. Of course, there are extensions to this. And then you introduce the additional equation that describes the parameter that is zero dynamics. Okay, parameters don't move, at least in the time scale considered here. And you have uncertainty on the initial conditions. So the uncertain parameters turn into uncertainty in initial conditions here. And you can apply filtering strategies as before. So for example, Kalman, but Kalman again, is not uh, tractable for the state part, even though it could be for the parameters. So what we would like, so you have in this case two, uh, the, 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 the Kalman gain could be uh, split into two parts. But what you want is not use Kalman for the state, but uh, uh, substitute this Luenberger type that we have uh, discussed. The difficulty is that for the parameters, you don't know of uh, Luenberger uh, strategies that work because the, the, the dynamics is not physical. So what you want here is, in, in essence, to retain Kalman filtering while changing to Luenberger observer here. Well, this is, we showed that this is possible. And the way you do it, so you use the Luenberger observer that works in the, in the state equation. You use the Kalman filter for, for uh, parameters, and then you need to correct the first observer equation by uh, a sensitivity of the state with respect to parameters, with no virtually little additional computational cost here. And we showed that this is actually effective in a, a series of, uh, of papers. Now, quickly, uh, in, the remaining, in the remaining time, I will show you some application of this using uh, medical imaging to characterize an infarct by uh, estimation. So this is, again, a collaboration with a, a hospital, in this case, in, uh, in, in Créteil. We used, some, again, some animal data obtained on a, on a pig. Uh, on which an infarct was actually created. So the idea here is by uh, occluding a coronary artery of the pig to control the extent and location of the, of the infarct, and this will be used for validation purposes of the, the whole estimation process. 
We have, of course, as data, we have a lot of uh, imaging, pressures, and so on. And the idea will be to uh, use this modeling and estimation uh, chain to characterize, that is, locate and uh, estimate the parameters uh, regarding the infected tissue. So what we want in this case is to estimate the contractility parameters that are these quantities in the, in the, the active modeling parts of the equation. Here is a calibration, again, model against uh, MR, MR sequences in baseline. So that is before the infarct was actually created. So again, a nice adequation of the model and, uh, and the images. And now this shows you the, the type of, of data that will be used in the estimation framework to perform this, uh, uh, this whole estimation uh, strategy that I out, uh, outlined in the previous slides. So what we used are segmented surfaces of one single ventricle in this case, the left, the main ventricle. What you vaguely can see in orangish over here are the parts that correspond to the infarct that again are known both from the controlled uh, protocol and here also from one a specific modality of imaging. So we have a control. Now, what you see here is the healthy model. So the model that was calibrated with respect to the uh, baseline uh, data against the data here in the infected heart, 38 days after uh, the infarct was, was, uh, was created. Of course, the healthy model doesn't know about the infarct, and it's, it contracts much more strongly that, than uh, the actual heart at this stage. So you have this uh, pretty big discrepancy. And this is what's going to be used in the sequential uh, data estimation strategy to correct the dynamics and estimate parameters at the same time. So here, what you have is the corrected, the observer system in uh, Magenta. So as you can see, it's, it's quite close to the data. It doesn't have to be uh, exactly coinciding with the data. It's, it's just a correction. And, but it's very close to the actual uh, walls. And then the orange was the, the heart before, uh, in fact. So you can see that that's a big difference. And in the same time, we estimate one quantity in uh, various regions of the heart. So this is a view from the top of the ventricle. This would sit on this, on this part. And dark means low contractility, light, high contractility. As you can see, the dark contractility really represents the part where the, the infarct was actually created. So of course, we don't have any ground truth in this case, other than this control information. But it's, it's, it's well, quite a nice uh, validation of this uh, estimation setup in, in a real data clinical uh, setup. So concluding remarks, uh, I summarized the, the type of multi-scale modeling that can be performed to represent the myocardium uh, based on actual physical and physiological considerations at all scales, starting with the nanoscale of the actin myosin bridges. We carried uh, fundamental physical requirements, in particular energy balance, all the way throughout the scales. And this is actually also true for the numerical procedures that we design. So these numerical procedures satisfy the, the energy balances. This, of course, is well adapted to multi-physics coupling, because uh, when you want to couple to other phenomena, chemistry, uh, fluid flows within the muscles, that is so-called blood perfusion, all this will, uh, need, will, will mean that you will be able to formulate the coupling in an energy consistent manner, if you start by components that satisfy these uh, balances. We have already some substantial experimental and clinical validation, as I showed. And uh, I also covered the uh, inverse problems that uh, you need to solve in this case, and showing that in, in our team, we focused on some 
novel types of uh, data estimation methods that we designed. And this uh, provides, of, of course, key information for a diagnosis, because once you estimate some actual uh, parameter values of interest uh, in, in, for, med for medical purposes, for example, this contractive value here has a meaning for a cardiologist, and this parameter cannot be measured uh, in any other way uh, in, in, in practice. So here, you provide something that's, that's very important for, for, for diagnosis. And then, once you have adapted your uh, model to the patient, you can carry out the program of patient-specific modeling. That is, you can use the model to predict uh, the future of the system, that is typically uh, the outcome of uh, therapeutic strategies, as, as I showed in the first, in the first place. Okay? Again, if you want to have a predictive model, you need to adapt it to a, to, to a given case. So here, the inverse problems have two benefits. Diagnosis, when you estimate, and then prognosis, when you use the predictive nature of the models. Okay, this is the end of my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. It's just a very naive uh, question uh, concerning the last uh, part of your talk. Uh, do you have some issues of observability of uh, the state when you estimate the parameters and the initial state? So it's uh, in practice, I mean. Well, of course, this, this is a very complex uh, problem. It's, it's, it's a major issue in estimation and inverse problems. Uh, so it's not something that you can answer in a unique manner uh, in general. So as, as you mentioned, it needs to be addressed, well, if, if not uh, only in practice, but it needs to be addressed uh, by looking at a given type of, of setup, that is, uh, a, a model that needs to be estimated versus the data that you have at hand to estimate the model. In our case, uh, the problem of uh, observability is, is mainly uh, an issue for identification purposes. That is, it's more an issue for identifying, estimating the parameters than for estimating the states. Medical images are very rich, as you can see, so it means that it's, it's uh, in practice, highly identifiable in respect to the state, whereas what you can have in terms of parameters, of course, depends on uh, not only the kinematics, but, but also the richness of the description in the model that you have. So if you want to estimate a large number of uh, parameters, which means that you have, for example, so com complex pathologies with, with multiple components of the system that are affected, then you may get into trouble in terms of, uh, of uh, estimation. The good news with uh, the type of strategies that we have, so sequential strategies, is that in the end, you not only have an estimate of the quantity itself, but also you have an estimate of the error that you perform. This is hidden in this, uh, in, in this covariance operator that you're actually computing also. You see, so it's a, you have an answer, but you also have a, a level of confidence in the answer in the estimation. And then there are lots of uh, additional considerations that you can uh, include uh, a priori to uh, assess the identifi identifiability uh, character of the system. And for this, you should, uh, the, the expert is uh, right here, so you can uh, ask him afterwards. Other uh, questions? Um, maybe a short one about the HPC uh, challenges that you 
that uh, you have to deal with for this kind of of uh, big simulations? Well, <laughs> it's a tricky question. Is is doing it deliberately? Uh, In our team, we are not uh, HPC focused. Focused, uh, so we 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 know that HPC uh, is, is highly technical. We cannot cover everything. You have seen that already. We cover quite a, a large spectrum of uh, of topics. Uh, of course, these are highly nonlinear, uh, multi physics model. So we're always limited by uh, the computing time. Okay? We, we don't want to spend uh, right now. Typically, well, Gauthier over there can tell you all about it, uh, a single heartbeat for uh, a, well, the, our basic, uh, our main biomechanical model would take, if, if you don't use sophisticated boundary conditions, it would take a couple of hours on, on a regular workstation. If you use uh, sliding contact to actually accurately represent the, the interaction with the external structures, it would take a day for a, for a heartbeat. Okay, so it, it takes a lot of time for a number of degrees of freedom that uh, is 20,000 degrees of freedom, 30,000 maybe. So it's a as you can see, we're limited. We would like to go uh, higher in terms of uh, of degrees of freedom to have finer meshes. We would like to couple with uh, other types of physics and so on. So we have uh, various uh, paths to try and achieve this. In particular, we have uh, well, a new code that we're actually building right now with uh, Sébastien Gilles in particular uh, that, that, that is PETC based. So in this case, we use some uh, HPC libraries uh, to achieve some higher uh, efficiency in the in the code, but it's a well, we you all know this, right? It's it's a it's a never-ending uh, race that you always want to push uh, the modeling further, and you're always uh, limited with the uh, computing uh, capabilities. Thank you very much. Other questions? Okay, so thanks again, Dominique. Thank you.